All right, guys, it's time to talk with our featured guest, Dr. Howard Ferran. Dr. Ferran, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good. How are you doing? I can't tell if I'm talking to Michael Arias of the Dental Marketer or the Karate Kid, uh, Ralph Macchio. <laughs> My God, both, you look just both, like Ralph that Macchio. guy. Yeah. Are I you going to put your hands out to the side and then fake with your left and drop kick me with your right? Man, if my balance was that good, I would always do that all the time to introduce myself, but that's that's not the case. <laughs> but yeah, man, why don't you tell the Dental Marketing Tribe a little bit about your past, present, and future, and how you got to where you are today? Man, that's a long story. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I had five sisters. My little baby brother wasn't uh, born until uh, I was a senior in high school, and uh my dad was uh, very poor, and he delivered bread. And uh, then when I was 10 years old, he bought a franchise Sony drive-in. And oh. he would eventually uh, buy one a year for nine years. But after after we had uh, his first one, I think he went from making like 11000 a year to 60000 a year. And I was 10 years old thinking, wow, a job really does change everything. Mm -hmm. And then after he had... Um, Two or three, we moved out to the suburbs. Then after he had five or six, we moved out to the nicest place in the world in, in Wichita, Kansas, Hidden Lakes Estates. And my next door neighbor was a dentist, Kenny Anderson, who still practices. And I'd go to work with my, my love of my life, my idol, my dad, and I loved him. But we'd make hamburgers and cheeseburgers. Then I'd go to work with Kenny Anderson, and he'd take x-rays, looking through teeth and doing root canals. And he had his own lab man. And... It was just love at first sight. And uh, and when I was in the sixth grade, I wrote my dental school letter asking him how I could become a dentist. And they and Diane Beard sent me a letter back that said I should go to high school and take science classes. And uh, so mm -hmm. I, I, I've been wanting to be a dentist, I think, since I was, I think that was uh, 12 years old. And um, so it's just uh, amazing. So then I was a dentist. And I loved dentistry as much as anyone I knew. And I just thought the dental journals were uh, um, just boring. I mean, like the big professional ones from the ADA, they'd have all these studies on, you know, cancer and rat mice's bones and all. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so by 1994, I thought, you know what? I can't get through one of these magazines. I'm going to start my own. So I called the Fran Report, and I would write a 30-page black and white newsletter to the dentist and then in 98, um, so I started that in 94. So in 98, I finally realized that the internet, we could all talk to each other. So it was no longer Ferran to you. And now it was interactive. So I dropped the Ferran and changed it to Dental Town and made the first interactive uh, website and message board in dentistry, which was six years before uh, uh, Facebook. And mm -hmm. my, my tagline was that with dentaltown.com, no dentist would ever have to practice solo again. And it exploded. I mean, we signed up a thousand people a month, every month, even all the way up to last month. We've never signed up less than a thousand dentists per month. And it's just so cool. And that it's still just to its dream. It's uh, with dentaltown.com, no dentist will ever have to practice solo again. And it continues to grow. A lot of people, when Facebook came out, they said, oh, that'll kill Dentaltown. Dentaltown just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, I think most people have 27, 28 apps on their phone. So it's not like you only do Instagram or you only do Snapchat, yeah. but, but dental town, I call it an inch wide. It's just dentistry, but it's a mile deep. I mean, it just drills down to how you could do a root canal, a filling, a crown, advertising, marketing, HR. So I just, I just, everything love on there. I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, there's so everything how, on so there. So how did you, uh, what was your journey like? How did you end up in dentistry? You started out as a nutritionist. Yeah. How did you go from what what was in your journey that made you want to be a nutritionist? Uh, was that for studying? Was that for your UFC camp training fight when you were trying out for Karate Kid Part Karate Two? Kid, yep, yep, that and was then it. How did you go from um, nutrition to dentistry? So I became a nutritionist because all my life I was a little okay. I'm five eight, so I was I was a little bit overweight. I was two hundred and fifty. Eight pounds at my max, I believe. Seriously, five yeah. eight and two fifty eight. Yeah, that was my max. Okay, look, Howard. Like in the sense, like I was two fifty eight, and then I remember coming back from the doctor, and I said, "Forget about it. Forget this. I don't care anymore. Let me just eat whatever." And then, like three months later, I ate whatever. So I don't even know how heavy I really got, but I know it was around. My heaviest was two fifty eight, and then um, after that, uh, I, I kept hearing like you know all these myths, like for example. 
um, you know, no carbs after six or, you know, hey, only eat, you know, certain types of food, only go paleo. So it got so confusing and I kept crashing on these diets. So I just decided to go to school for myself and, and learn about it. And I did. And so then I dropped down all the way to, I think, like 130 in like a year. Um, and then after that, just kind of started trying to get back up my body composition. And then, um, yeah, I became a nutritionist. And then what I came do you, out what do you weigh now? Right. right now, I'm like at 158, 155, 155. Well, God, 155. talk about that because you're talking to a fat boy who's been on every damn diet. <laughs> And I always blame it on my genes because it runs in the whole family. I mean, you know, I got, I got, there's some very, very big people in my family, me included. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what do you think it was? What, what was, how would you summarize what you learned in college on nutrition to go from 258 to 130? I mean, there's so much. For example, like, here's the thing, like, when people say, there's just so many myths to bust. Like, there's so many. I don't know which one to pick. So, for example, when people say like, n try to eat no carbs, right? The body, you need carbs, first of all, right? So for example, say you've been eating normal, right? Then you step on the scale and then you say you weigh like, let's just for the sake of numbers, uh, 200 pounds. And then you said, you know what? Forget this. I'm going to cut out carbs. You cut out carbs, right? Keep in mind, one gram of carbs holds three grams of water. So you cut out 10 grams of carbs, right? Or let's just say you cut out a whole lot. You step on the scale, you see that you lost weight immediately. So then you're going to think, Oh man, this cutting out carb things works. Then you're going to keep cutting out, keep cutting out and keep cutting out until your body says, Hey, look, Michael, I can't do any more in order to survive because I need it for brain function, muscle, glycogen. I need it for a lot of things. So I need to survive because the body needs to, you know, obviously survive. And so it's not going to cut out anymore. Then that's when you hit that plateau where you're like, Oh, you know what? Let me just have this one time burgers or nachos and all these things. Right. Which is not bad. And then you eat it then you're going to gain all that water weight back. So really, in reality, all you're really just doing is fluctuating water. In your mind, you're thinking, dang, I just lost like 25 to 30 pounds. But no, you really just lost a lot of water that you've been retaining because of the carbs. So what you need to do is just kind of honestly, like change your lifestyle. Like what's your lifestyle looking like right now, Howard, in the sense like what's from morning to like when you snore, what are you eating? God, I, uh, just keep educating. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to come out of the closet and scare people. But it, it, it's it's tough because um, over over the thirty years of being a dentist, I cannot tell you how many patients were so upset because they lost their their great job, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in two thousand eight. And I'll never forget one of my patients of twenty years, loved to death, um, lost his job, and he said to feed my family, the only job I could find was sheetrocking in construction. And um, he went from like 250, being just this fat, amorphous blob. And then the next time I saw him for a cleaning, he looked like he was the rock. And he was saying, yeah, he goes, he goes I, I make half as much money and I uh, have the, the body I never thought I'd have. But there, I've seen a lot of examples where people go in from a desk job, like dentistry, where you sit on a chair all day, to yeah. a manual labor job. And uh, it's a game changer. Yeah, and the thing is, is like, Everybody has their own formula. So you can't follow the exact same diet that everybody else has. You got to figure out your BMR, your basal metabolic rate. That means if you were just to sit or lay down for 24 hours, our body burns a certain amount of calories, right? You got to figure out what, how many calories, carbs, um, protein, fiber, and fat you're burning or you're utilizing while you're in your BMR stage. So how, how does a guy figure out his BMR stage? Um. Uh, Depends. I mean, not depends. It's really only one formula. So pretty much what you got to do is uh, you can either go on Google if you want and just put in BMR calculator and then just put in your height, weight, and then your um, height, weight, age. And then it figures it out for you depending on your activity. Then it's going to ask how active are you? Are you sedentary, like desk job? Are you active, like, med like medium active, like a nurse maybe? Or are you like a construction worker? Or are you a football player? Like that's that's your job. Like you have to be a football player, you know? It'll, it'll give you very specifics on that. And then you just put how active you are, and then it can calculate the formula. And then from that point on, that's where you figure out, okay, do I want to lose or gain, right? And if you want to lose, you got to go according to how active you are. So say you're like hardly active, seldomly. You don't even go to the gym, like maybe like once a month. Then you say, okay, you know, that times 1.2, right? Or 1.33, because that's the formula we use for um, 
to times our macronutrients, your protein, carbs, and fats. And then boom, it's going to tell you your, your calorie count, like your daily calorie needs. And then from that point on, depends on your situation. Do you want to eat more fats, want more carbs? Um, you have to have a certain amount of protein regardless according to your body weight, right? So then you have the protein and then you just divide maybe 0.30 divided by for your fats. So 0.30 divided by the whole calorie count. And then whatever's left, you just divide that by four because there's in four in one gram of protein and carbs, there's four calories. In one gram of fat, there's nine calories. One gram of alcohol is seven calories. So keep that in mind. Alcohol doesn't so, work for us. So so go through those again. One gram of what as what? Okay, so one gram of protein and carbs is four calories, right? One gram of fat is nine calories. That's a lot more. And then one gram of alcohol is seven calories. But remember, ca alcohol does nothing for us. Like it does nothing. Our body doesn't utilize it for anything. So that's the hard. So for example, when we're drinking alcohol, right? Our body automatically thinks it's a poison. So it's going to stop the digestion of everything else. It's going to stop the digestion of the burger you just had, everything else. And it's going to say, whoa, hold on, body. I need to get rid of this first because I don't know what it is. It's a foreign thing. It's going to try and get rid of the alcohol. That's why we start you know, urinating a lot and things like that when we're drinking too much alcohol because your body's trying to get rid of it. In the meantime, all the fats, protein, and carbs of that other foods that you've been eating throughout the day is put on hold. And if it's put on hold for too long, then it's just fat, right? So that's why if you drink too, My too much My boys uh, wrestled from age five. Um, starting at five, we, all four boys, we year round wrestled for a decade. I mean, we're just, uh, over the top wrestlers. And, um, I thought it was very interesting that when they were in high school, how so many would tell me that their friends for their wrestling would never drink alcohol. So they, uh, they smoked pot instead. They, they, and, uh, hmm. and then how many athletes have you heard getting busted for a pot? Like the, the guy who won the most gold medals ever in swimming. Phelps, you know, right? Yeah, Phelps, yeah. You know, ruined half his advertising because he. Uh, but 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 yeah. they never talk about the issues. They just out someone, then throw them under a bus. But um, I I've never talked to Phelps, obviously. But I bet you, a lot of his reasoning. Well, when I want to have a good time, I'm not going to drink this toxic poison. I'm going to do this uh, this weed or something. Weed, but, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So alcohol is a. Um, I, and I also saw, I love vice news. I think it's, it's the best news out there. You know, all the TV news, it's all politics, 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 but vice yeah. news actually old fashioned sends a journalist covers a story, but it is amazing. The difference between me and you is that when I was your age, I mean, I'm 54 back in the day, food was 30% of disposable income. And then it got mass produced, so it got it down to 10%. So that's like a hooray, food costs went from 30% to 10%. So everybody's all glad. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, that fast mass produced feed, they, they were talking about obesity where all these fast food joints are going. You know that now Mexico has more obesity, uh, higher yeah. per, oh, percent of it than the United States. And Qatar and these na nations like Kuwait that have a McDonald's and a KFC and a Burger King on every corner. And they're going in and just loving it. And um, obesity, mm -hmm. diabetes, metabolic. I mean, it's just uh, so food got cheaper. So now we're living with the consequence of what happens when food is mass produced and now costs two thirds less. You know, when I was little, only rich people went to restaurants and flew yeah. on airplanes. I mean, you know, the, the poor man who had three kids didn't take his family to the restaurant. Couldn't. Yeah, he couldn't. And now the poorest yard guy pushing a weed eater uh in phoenix could take his family to burger king or carl's juniors or wendy's and get a smorgasbord of food where back in the day he'd had to be in the top 10 or 20 percent income to do something like that yeah yeah and you're right like so much and here's the thing like in reality there's only in the whole world like four to five companies that control all the food in the whole world in reality I mean, there's those farmers markets as well, right? The people who are trying to fight the people, like the farmers markets, those smaller farms, but they're suffering. Like well, I have a couple friends who own farms here in California and their they, their income, like you would think their income is maybe like, you know, 100, 200,000. No, it's it's like in reality, maybe 20, 30,000. And people are trying to buy them out, right? But if they buy them out, they become, in their terms, they feel like they become slaves. You know what I mean? They have to start doing things to their yeah it's um animals. i love that chart on those 10 companies it's uh nestle 10, yeah. pepsico coca-cola unilever 
Danone, General Mills, Kellogg's, Mars, Associated Bread Food, and Mondelez um, basically controls, basically for all practical purposes, the entire food industry. Yeah. And then they do these things like, oh, Tyson is, for example, like uh, the laundry detergent, um, Tide and, um, I forgot the other one called with Little Bear. They, they Tide and, uh, glad, glad? No, I forgot. But for example, they always fight like, oh, which one's better? Which one's better? They're both from the same company, right? Just like the NFL, right? The NFL, they're all from the same, every single team is from the same company, but we're spending money on marketing techniques, man. Like that's advertising. It's just ways to cons- consume more. Same thing with the food. Like it's just about so what, money. So the reason this is so pertinent to dentistry though is uh, there's a huge thread on this in dentistry that our post on um, um, how to get in great shape. There's one of those threads, how to get in great shape. I think it has 25, 30,000 posts on it. And, but, wow. a, but a lot of this stuff has to do with the fact that when the dentist gets obese, when the dentist gets diabetic, when, you know, he, he loses energy, it's hard to go in there and be, I mean, we do all hands-on surgery, so we have to have mm-hmm. some athletic component. I mean, we're not set, you know, so what would you say to a dentist who was fat, short, bald, had four boys and two grandchildren? I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. I'm just asking for yeah, a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what would you say to that guy? Um, what, what would be your, your, your five minute version of, of how to, um, get back in shape, uh, by eating right? I really wouldn't say much. I would ask him to tell me exactly from like morning to night, what you eat. And then from morning to when you go to sleep, how you are active throughout the day. Then from that point on, we can get a better understanding of like, Hey, well, it's easy to tell you like, you know, from what you're eating, obviously, and how you're feeling, why your body's becoming like this and how your diabetes is. Cause once you become insulin resistant right that's even harder man like insulin resistant is it takes up so much of your um not just energy and time but it's just it just makes it even harder for you to lose weight because it's like your body is literally fighting against your insulin receptors aren't going to be taking in the insulin that you're supposed to be taking so your glycogen or your carbs are just stored as more you know fat so you really need to pay attention to the glycemic index now i don't know if like your doctor has told you about the glycemic index or not but it's pretty much you know foods that are low in the glycemic scale that are not as fast um, acting carbohydrates. So they're more slow or complex in the glycemic index. And yeah, I'd tell you to kind of consume that a little bit more. You would have to really, really be really like once you get diabetes, I don't think people realize like once you get diabetes or some type of obesity related situation, that's when you really have to like take care of like what you're eating. It's not like, all right, let me just start cutting out, I guess, fats or carbs. Let me just not go to Wendy's every single lunch hour instead of, you know, or whatever. Like you really, really need to start paying attention to your diet. Like that's where it's very important to start because your body's telling you, man, like, Hey, I already got diabetes. Like, so, so what do you, what do you think of another thing that goes on every dental office is where they, uh, they have a coffee pot going all day. I mean, I mean, there, there's dentists that are still drinking coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Then you become caffeine. Like your um, neurons become kind of like resistant to the to the caffeine. So you can like, you know how there's those people who can drink coffee and like go to sleep? You become like that. I mean, coffee is, is um, it's better than drinking like energy drinks and things like that. But too much of it, too much of anything can obviously be bad, right? Even like too much of water, for example, you can get water poisoning if you drink too much of that. So it's, it's, um, you're just kind of depending more on your caffeine source. So, for example, calories is energy, right? Fats is energy. Proteins is energy. Carbs is energy. Carbs is your main source of energy that your body goes for. If you're using too much caffeine, right, coffee, and your body's going to depend on that source of energy, right, a lot now because you're using it all the time. It's not really going to attack its energy that it needs. For example, like the carbs, the fats, or the protein. You really don't ever want it to attack the protein in your muscle, though. That means you're not eating enough. So mainly you want to attack the carbs, right? Once that runs out, it's going to start attacking the fats, which is good. That's what you kind of want if you are overweight. And so, yeah, that's pretty much like a good cup of coffee, eight ounce maybe, or a macchiato or whatever, like a a really quick espresso would be good to keep up. But try and depend on your own energy sources or else you're going to feel lethargic throughout the whole day all the time, you know, and you don't really want to do that. So how on your journey did you go from this to dental marketing? Where, how, how did that come about? I completely forgot about the demo. Uh, well, pretty much. Okay, so I was working at a company as a nutritionist here in Newport Beach. 
Um, and I had a buddy who was a uh, dental consultant, right? And he was telling me, hey, man, because in, in the company I worked with, I helped it start up here in California. And then from that point on, that took a lot of like marketing. And um, once it was open, then I became a nutritionist. And then after that, or I became a nutritionist for the company. I was always a nutritionist before that. And then um, anyways, I had a friend who was a dental consultant. And then he kind of let me know like, hey, look, I need to find patients as quickly as possible for this one client. But I don't I don't know how to do that. Right. And then so I just said, why don't you just do some ground marketing? Like it's simple as that. And he said he's tried it before, but it hasn't worked with the employees. So I said, let me see what I can do. So the next day, it took me literally nine hours to get just one new patient. And that one patient is still a patient of that office. Then the next day, it took me 12 hours to get another patient. And then I thought, now I understand why, like, employees can't handle this because, like, it's, it's too much. And it's too much for me, too. Like, we need to create some type of system. We need to do something about it. So pretty much I just started from that point on experimenting with ground marketing, which is guerrilla marketing. And then – um. Yeah, I just kind of started creating pipelines and systems for like, for example, say there's a local dentist here and then there's a Walmart um, beside him. Then there's a, another store beside him. And then there's a warehouse. There's a Coca-Cola factory. What I would do is I would go into those places, do lunch and learns, just kind of set up pipelines. I would do events, set up booths consistently, right, every week or so and just build pipelines so that new patients can start kind of just going in and going in and going in like they get employees and then I'll say hey look everybody in the Coca-Cola factory all you employees like we have a specific membership program just for you and your family just for you guys so I mean they already built a rapport with me so they're perfect you know that 20 new patients 30 new patients would start coming in you know slowly but surely and then yeah that's how I kind of got into that and then I started just studying about digital marketing you know um SEO. I've always been into SEO and things like that. But I mean, mainly what I do is the the ground marketing, the digital mark. I mean, the ground marketing. Yeah, guerrilla marketing. So, so talk about guerrilla marketing. Uh, you know, Google says guerrilla marketing is an advertising strategy concept designed for businesses to promote their products and service in an unconventional way with little budget to spend. This involves high energy and imagination, focusing on grasping the attention of the public in more personal and memorable levels. Um, that is, you know, mo when they got in advertising, they just wanted to write a check. You know, the Yellow Page guy had come by, they'd sign the deal. Uh, so yeah. A direct mail guy comes by, he'd sign the deal. They, they kind of like doing marketing without having to leave their dental operatory. The, talk about guerrilla marketing, which is so much more powerful. And um, what, 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 gorilla, what does guerrilla marketing mean to you? Where, do you? where do you see it being used in dentistry? Well, like guerrilla marketing has always been kind of used before digital marketing, you know, like that's how we would we would always operate as far as when we wanted more customers in the door. And like, to be honest, like, let's face it, people are not online 24 seven, right? They go to work, they go shopping, they go to school and do other activities in their community. So I just kind of thought like, hey, why not be there? Right. If there, nobody ever goes online and says, all right, I'm going to be on the Internet. What should I look up at today? Let me look at a dental website. You know, nobody really ever says that. They just kind of look at stuff. If they're ever in pain or they need a dentist, that's when they look up like, hey, best dentist in Phoenix. Right. Or whatever. That's where that stuff comes in. But guerrilla marketing, you're kind of out there already with the community. You could participate in events, host them yourself. Uh, you could talk to kids and parents at schools or be present at an employee health fair or just do lunch and learns. And that's a great time to set up like a table and offer them free toothbrushes or just get to know them more about more about them and their family. It's a super easy way to build rapport because you're actually doing people to people. You know what I mean? Like person to person contact. You're actually talking with people, with the community and you're not invisible. Right. It's not just a picture on a website. So I kind of thought of it as like, you know, person to person contact creates trust. People do business with people they know. Right. Like and they trust getting out in the community like it speeds up that process so they get to see you and your employee as friendly honest people and not only as in um, online or digital ad so like when a customer sees you participating connecting with them and things like that they'll begin to think of you as the authority dentist or the go the go-to person when they need dental services like i never try to be super salesy or anything like that whenever it comes to somebody they kind of they kind of just come to you and you'd be surprised like i honestly recommend that for everybody howard like if 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 everybody were just to kind of get a, a booth and set up outside their practice or set up at a place or Rite Aid or wherever they let you set up at, um, just set up and you'll see like how many people are looking for you just as much as you're looking for them. 
Like they'll pass by and say, oh, I was just looking for a dentist or, hey, I actually have this pain right here. Or, hey, do you take my insurance? And then they'll give you their insurance card and things like that. It's surprising. But we have this mentality where like, oh, no, we're running out of new patients. We need to compete with the other person. But like that's not our competition. Like our competition is like like Mercedes. Our competition is, um, you know, Tesla, all these other products that, you know, people are choosing to spend their money on instead of their their smile. So you'd be surprised, like I said, how many how many people are actually looking at, for a dentist out there. So that's why, like, I, I just recommend that. Like, if anybody doesn't even want to go with the dental market or anything like that, just do a booth, and you'll see, like, it's just people you're real, and they can trust you with their oral health and all these things. So for me, that's what I like. And also, you get better contact information. Right then and there, you can always ask them, like, hey, what's your name, email address? When do you want – can you come in Tuesday? They'll let you know and things like that. My God, I mastered guerrilla marketing in 1987 before it was even a term. Just like I am, um, we launched Dental Town in 1998, and Facebook didn't come out until 2004. But you know, you know what my original guerrilla marketing was. You, you know, you talk about a uh, low cost, high energy. What did it? I went on weekends on Saturday and Sunday. I went door to door. I knocked on every single front door. It took me half a year to Jeez. knock on every door. And I brought a backpack, and it had gloves, had a mirror, and had an appointment book, and uh, toothbrushes, my name and phone numbers on it, and uh, kids come to the door, I'd give them toothbrushes. And I'd say about, oh, probably two out of three doors just tried to get rid of me or thought it was weird or what, whatever, just thought, well, that's weird, a dentist on my door. Every third door, oh, my God, really? You're the dentist up by Safeway? And, uh, and then <laughs> come out there. I can't tell you how many men in their underwear – <laughs> Walked down their patio, showed me their broken molar. And there I am putting on gloves and a mirror and shining a flashlight. Then I pull out my appointment book and I said, well, you need to come in. And they, they said, well, you know what, well, you know what, what, what works best for you? And I'm like, well, I got an opening 24 hours a day, seven days a week until the end of time. <laughs> uh, does any of that work? And then other gorilla marketing we did is, um, okay, okay. I, I always say we're not with Tugi, but you got to explain that. I'm in Phoenix. But Phoenix is a weird city where it has a park that's 100 blocks wide at the very bottom on the south side. And 90% and of Phoenix is all north of that South Mountain Park. Yeah. South of the South Mountain is this little bitty strip, and it looks like the shape of a pizza. And it's Phoenix, but everybody there calls themselves Ahwatukee. And if you say to them, do you live in, Ahw in Phoenix? They go, no, I live in Ahwatukee. Uh, just kind of like if you go to L.A., if you meet someone and say, do you, do you live in L.A.? And they go, no, I live in Hollywood. Well, Hollywood's L.A., yeah, but, they, but... They, but they're, they're tribal, social animal tribalism. They identify with Hollywood. They don't identify with L.A. And some mm -hmm. people in L.A. will say, well, if you ask them where they live, they say, oh, I live in Cali. It's like they identify more with California than they do. It's so Central, people are trying yeah. that way. But anyway, um, Awatuki has an Easter parade the Saturday before Easter. And so we always make a float and we, the whole office, you know, has today's dental shirts on and all these people on the site are yelling our names and this, and that. we're throwing out toothbrushes, their name and number. And then mm -hmm. at the end of that parade is a carnival and they have all these booths and, in the parking lot. It's only $10 to run a booth. So we just Jeez. put a table there. And then someone goes down to the, uh, the Arizona office of dental health, the government agency. And we just say, there's a, a dental, uh, there's going to be a fair in Phoenix. Do you have any free brochures? They could load up three Suburbans with stuff. I mean, in fact, the staff's glad. They go, oh, my God, we got so much crap. We'd love to get rid of this. <laughs> and I basically just carry stuff out to my Suburban in boxes. And it's brochures uh -huh. on sealants and, you know, community water fluoridation or whatever the heck. You know, every oral cancer, mouth cancer. And then other little things like like the farmer's market. Yeah, they'll send the boots. Okay. So in Ahwatukee, there's just a farmer's market and it's only on Sunday and it's basically from six to noon. And, mm. you know, you got all you got all these different staff, but you put your dental assistant in there or your hygienist there. Every person comes by. How you doing? Where are you at? But they see you out there and you're pressing the flesh and they get to meet a human. And I, uh, um, every February is dental health month. So we break up. Uh, the two high schools, the four middle schools, mm -hmm. and the 12 elementary schools, you can always get in the third graders. And yeah. you, you go in there and you talk to them about, about dental care. And you're, I, I think guerrilla marketing is massive. And, 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 then if you, and then 
the closest you can get to guerrilla marketing is, I think it's very impressive when I go to a dentist's website and there's a uploaded YouTube video of, of the dentist. Yeah. I mean, I mean mm-hmm. they, they go to your website and it's like, okay, you're the best dentist and it's, it's a still photo with you and your wife and dog and cat and whatever. But I think it's really damn cool when you click there's the video. YouTube video and there, there's the man, there's the dentist yeah. talking and, and they get to feel chemistry and, oh, that's the dentist. And, you know, and uh, so... Yeah, yeah, no, you said it. Like, you said it. Like, I don't understand why. Well, I, I guess I do, but I mean, because of time, but I feel like more people should be doing that type of ground marketing, guerrilla marketing, right? Especially now, like, kind of in an age where everything's online. I mean, if you're out there and you're talking to people, you're you're going to get new patients. Like, I've never seen, it's never happened where our team has never gotten new patients or any employees that I've coached have never gotten new patients. Like, people's, people sign up. People want to go. People move to a new community all the time. So, I mean, ground marketing is, is, is there, like, you know what I mean? Like it's a cheaper way, a lot cheaper way. Especially in the big cities. I mean, that's changed so much. Like when I was little and I go visit my uh, grandparents, they were in Parsons, Kansas. Pretty mm-hmm. much everyone that lived in Parsons, Kansas is, was third, fourth, fifth generation. They were born there and died there. And mm-hmm. now cities like um, Phoenix and LA, they have a, Phoenix has a 10% churn flip a year. 10% of this city leaves a year. That's why you should do more root canals and implants because there's a good chance that when you screw it up and it fails, by that time they've already moved to LA and you don't have to yeah. worry about all your failures. That was yeah, a joke. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a huge <laughs> joke. But, uh, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, but it is. It's a, I mean, and a lot of, t- a lot of, you know, back in the day, people would live their whole, you know, life in all their patients, all their dental patients. They were just in that town. But there's a lot of, uh, Ever since they started the interstate system, it, you know, that was the mm. infrastructure that started this whole change to where now the country turned into just a one town. And, really? Uh, yeah. Before the interstate system, 90% of Americans were born, raised, reared, and died and never went 90 miles away from home. That was a 90-90-year-old. 90% of Americans never went 90 miles away from home. Then they built these interstates where people walk out the interstate and said, oh, my God, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. I can drive all the way to Disneyland on this big old highway big, yeah and yeah, we did that right. my dad i mean my dad he put my five sisters me in the back there's a station wagon uh, we put all the uh seats down so it made it flat and we played monopoly me and my five sisters uh why mom and dad sat it in the front seat with a case of old milwaukee between them and uh, they're drinking beer and throwing them out the windows as this <laughs> family drove all the way to la with no seat belts on and uh, uh you know just a little different time back then Hey, what was your favorite uh, thing to order on Sonic? I'd say it was the Frito chili pie where they crushed up oh, the Fritos man. and they put a spoon of chili on top and onion. They don't and cheese. have that no more. They don't have that no more, right? I haven't seen it. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. That was my favorite. But you Neat. can make that at home, and that that's very nutritious. Whenever you start with the bottom core of the dish, Fritos, very you nutritious. know you're a nutritionist. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, how do you how do you go wrong when the base is Fritos? I mean, you know, they uh, um, yeah, and talk about sensitivity. I remember a little. The most fun thing about eating a bag of Fritos was the Frito Bandito eraser you put on the end of your pencil. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, yeah. Dang, and, yeah then, uh, and then and uh, then they had to pull it because uh, uh, Hispanic people said it was uh, it was not cool. Yeah, uh, but uh, that I think you know Cracker Jacks. You'd eat them to get the prize. And a bag of Fritos, you would eat that to get the little Frito Bandito that you put on the end of your pencil. But, uh, oh, yeah. That makes me wonder, like, whatever happened to the Taco Bell Chihuahua? Remember? Yeah. Your Taco Bell? I wonder what happened to him, too. I wonder if, like, the Hispanics, we'd said something Well, that, about. that's kind of interesting food. I, I, the Hispanic food is interesting. There's really no such thing as Hispanic food. I mean, the difference in Hispanic food between Phoenix and New Mexico is huge. By the time you get to Texas, it's Tex-Mex. When I go south yeah. the border and lecture in Mexico, by the time you get to, um, say, uh, Puerto Vallarta, you can't even find anything that you would think is Mexican food in that whole city. I mean, really? yeah, you go into any restaurant, nice, rich, poor. Hey, can I get an enchilada, a taco? They're just looking like, what? And I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> it's like mostly seafood and all these things like that. And you're like, well, can I just get two Mariscos. beef tacos? <laughs> and it, cheese and gelata. They're like, what? What? So, yeah, food is a. Uh, and my favorite Italian restaurant is actually the Serbian people. Uh, they opened up a restaurant called Valbeni's. 
but they Serbia is right next to Italy, and they go, well, mm-hmm. Serbian food isn't a genre in America, so it's kind of just like Italian food, a little different, kind of like Mexican food between Phoenix and New Mexico. So they call it Italian food, and everybody says they get the best Italian food. It's not even Italian food. It's Serbian food, uh, mm. but marketing would say that if you're in America, let's not call it Serbian food. That's kind of rare. No one knows what that yeah. is, but everybody's yeah. looking for Italian. So what? So what? If, what if someone said to you? What if someone called you up and said, "Hey, but by, by the way, is is your last name Arias? Is that is that part yeah. of the? Is that the zodiac? The the first month of the year Arias? I don't know. Is that where know. that name would come from? Oh no, you're thinking of Aries. No, it's it's Arias. I don't know. It's Spain. A R I A S. I don't. I, I think really... it's a Spanish version of the first month of the zodiac. Is it? I don't know. Huh. But anyway, um, what would you say if some dentist called you up and said, "You know what, dude? Look, I I pay my rent, I pay my rent equipment, bill out computer insurance, I I pay all my bills. If I just could get ten more new patients a month, it'd be nothing but net. I would just need ten more a month. What would you say to that doc? Are they? Is the doc doing like any digital marketing or anything like that? Or no, nothing at all. Nothing at all. We're nothing talking about all? some fifty year old bald fat half senile dentist he's in parts with kansas he doesn't do any marketing he used to do the yellow pages but it got to be a thousand dollars a month and he Dang, couldn't really? remember the last wow. time anybody came in with it uh okay, he did some direct mail back in the day but now he wants to do marketing and he's mm-hmm. bombarded with so many messages because there's so many consultants who tell you that marketing is but basically it's, it's all about facebook it's all Facebook, Facebook. I've seen Facebook. that so much. Like, hey, that, hey, let me do your Facebook ads. Let me do your Facebook ads. And there's so many like millennials. Do you, do, you, do you think Facebook is all that in advertising, or do you think there's other more effective ways? What? Ah, uh, there's 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 definitely other effective ways. But Facebook is pretty important. Like uh, Anissa, Doctor Anissa Holmes, she kind of taught me some ways as far as how that works, the algorithm, because it's always changing. But other than that, I mean, I never really. Never really, um, as far as for too much, like too much Facebook ads for one community that can happen because there's other doctors doing it, other doctors doing it. I mean, you're never really on Facebook to look for a dentist all the time. You know what I mean? But, uh, if it was a dent, if it was a doctor who said, Hey, you need 10 more patients. Yeah. I recommend like, Hey man, first of all, like, can people see you online or on your Yelp or anything like that? Right. Like let's increase those reviews. Other than that, if you're looking for the most like, like cost effective way, just do ground marketing, honestly. Like, just set up at events or go into your local, like Walmart or Target or whatever. You know what I mean? Rite Aid or Safeway. These people actually let you go in and talk to the employees. They'll let you even set up a booth if you want outside or inside. You just gotta say the right scripts, say the right words, and then from that point on, it's easy. Once a week, set up at a vitamin shop. Once a week, you know, just kind of sign up new people, and then that's it. What do you think about some of the old school stuff? Direct mail. Um, I think it works for some, and I think it doesn't work for some. Like I've had clients who say it works. I have clients who say, "Hey, man, like my ROI is ridiculous. Like it doesn't work at all." So it really just have depends. You, have on you the found community. any common threads in between them? Because I know some of my friends that just want implant patients. They want they want to upgrade your denture into all on four. A lot mm-hmm. of those sixty, seventy, eighty year old people aren't on Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram. And uh, they still walk out to their mailbox every day because it's like a treat. Like the mail, the mailman just came when you're 70 years old. It's like, gosh darn, put your glass of wine down. The put mailman. Your glass of wine down. No, it's seriously that. I think that's the most biggest overlooked thing when people talk about addiction and alcoholism. My, um, I have like two patients that uh, work in the big uh, liquor department, whether it be yeah. at the grocery store or whatever, and they say every single morning when they open at eight o'clock. There's 200 senior citizens waiting Jeez, to come in. Yeah, and they, he says, I see them every day. And every day they buy, I mean, there's basically two types of customers. They either buy the half gallon or the gallon. And he says it's a, yeah, because so many people, I mean, when you're, when, you, when you're retired, you have nothing left to do. A lot of them just think the best <laughs> idea is drink. to wake up with a, uh, with, you know, make a picture of uh, Bloody Marys or whatever they uh, like to do. But yeah, mostly. because mo- a lot of people don't do any of that kind of stuff during the week because they have to get them go to jo- work. Yeah, and it was Gandhi, yeah, you're right. And it was Gandhi who said idle hands is the work of the devil. He said, he said, I don't care if all you do is take all the poor people and have them pick up a rock on the west side of town and spend all day dropping off the east side of town. Well, just whatever. Just keep them moving. 
Um, you mm-hmm. know, um, just good. idle hands is just gets you in trouble. Yeah, especially, like especially when you have uh, four boys, Ryan. <laughs> and uh, well, that that's why so is many Ryan just looking. Moms, Ryan's just like yeah, he just laughs yeah. at me all day. He's a- actually after uh, working with this podcast with me for over a year, he's dead inside. <laughs> he's uh, he died. He's just he going died. through the motions. But Poor yeah, Ryan, but dude. so many people have their kids and all those activities just to keep them out of trouble. Yeah, and that's one thing. Like, for example. If you are looking for new patients, you can also do daycares and like kinder cares and things like that. You can just set up there, teach the kids, teach the kids, quote unquote, but really just stay there until the parents show up. And the parents are going to be like, hey, you've been teaching my kids. What have you been teaching my kids? And then boom, like you can say, hey, like we're a family dentist like right here. But here's the thing, like Howard, like you got to what you got to understand, like if you want to be an implant dentist or you want to be a, a pure cosmetic dentist, things like that, like branding, like you got to understand like, and I know that sounds like so, I guess, cliche or so out there, but you really, really need to figure out, especially like in this day of age, like your brand. Like, I think Forbes.com said it where it, like brands are psychology and science, right? Brought together as a promise mark as opposed to a trademark. So products have life cycles. Brands outlive products. Brands convey a uniform quality, credibility, um, and experience, right? Brands are valuable. For example, when, when, um, that motor company in India, right, bought Jaguar and they bought Range Rover from Ford. What did they buy? Did they buy factories? Did they buy raw materials, employees? No, right? Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, um, they helped uh, Ford sell the brands to that company for $2.56 billion, right? And the brands were worth more than all the ingredients combined. So branding is essential. Like brands are build incredible, they build incredible value for companies. So you can regardless like we all have a brand either whether we like it or not we can either be the cheapest dentist in town we can be the dentist that no one knows about we can be the dentist in between two two stores whatever right that's where you got to figure out your brand that's where once you figure that out your marketing comes in right the more narrow or the more niche you become like the more you're going to see of that influx coming in of whether it's implants or the or whatever procedure you're doing right but if you're trying to be everything and you're trying to market to everyone you're not really going to get many people. But if you become niche, if you're starting to, you know, hey, let's just do cosmetic. Let's just be drill and fill. That's all we're going to do. Or let's just accept this type of insurance or no insurance or be for schedule, things like that. Then you're going to start building your brand. And it takes time. But I mean, like eventually specific implants are only going to go to you, be referred to you. Specific uh, TMJ patients are only going to go to you and things like that. So that's where I think it's more important. Like, hey, figure that out. Figure out your brand, right? And then from that point on, we can start marketing that out because you got to be different. You got to differentiate yourself from others. Like, for example, if you're still not convinced, like that branding is not important. Like, for example, let's think like about the dollar, right? The dollar is a world brand, right? And in essence, it's, it's simply a piece of paper, really. But branding has made it so valuable that all the tools of marketing and branding and brand building have been used to create its value. So on the front, you'll find the owner of the brand, right? The Federal Reserve. There's a testimonial from the president of the United States, which is George Washington. There is a, it, there is a simple user's guide that says this note is a legal tender of debts public and pi- private. And if you're still not convinced, the owner has added the all important message on the back where it says in God we trust, right? So the dollar is a world, it's world brand. It confers a uniform value um, globally. But like, as I said, it's really just a piece of paper, right? Branding has made it worth something. So in the same thing, like you got to, like I said, you got to figure out your brand. That's what I, to me, it's most important. You have to figure out your brand. That way it's not only the marketing becomes easier, everything, the SEL, the digital marketing, the PPC, all that becomes easier, but people automatically in the community know why you're there, who to go to for and things like that. That was awesome. That was amazing. I've never heard anybody in marketing uh, go over the dollar bill. That was that was just pure poetry, man. That was <laughs> kudos, dude. No, seriously, that was world class. Because it, it brought up a lot of thoughts. I mean, um, so many Americans do not realize how valuable that their dollar is international currency. Like when you go to a country like um, Haiti, the reason Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere is because they used to have cruise ships go there. But, dude, they, they couldn't keep their crime under control, and some of the uh, people were getting uh, mugged and stuff. So the cruise ships stopped going there. Once they stopped going there, they had no 
currency. They had no international currency. So if Haiti printed a billion dollars and came over here and said, we want to buy a billion dollars worth of your stuff, your cars from Ford and Chrysler, well, Ford and Chrysler wouldn't take their currency because they could only take that money and buy something from the island of Haiti, which they don't export anything in. And mm -hmm. the United States, by being the international world currency, it's just a piece of paper. It's fiat currency, and America is the largest counterfeiter in the world. And, I, and I'm, this isn't a conspiracy here. I'll, I'll tell you something. In 2008, this is in the notes of the Federal Reserve. In 2008, when it collapsed, they so feared that, you know, the whole banking system was going to collapse. So while Congress was spending the weekend coming up with this, I think it was like a $600 billion bailout package, and, and the uh, Federal Reserve guy – um, who went to MIT, was a doctor. No one calls him doctor. They only call physicians doctors. His doctor. Yeah. His, his uh, thesis paper was on the Great Depression. He didn't admit for four years that that night they printed $8 trillion. Because back in the day, Jeez. when it was gold and silver, you had to have the gold and silver. And that was the limits. Um, then it went to paper, where you actually had to have printing presses make and cut and stack all this paper. Well, there's no more even paper anymore. I mean, 90% of all banking is digital, ones and zeros, electronic. And the um, the there's uh, and we now have our first paperless country. We're now the banks in one, in one in Scandinavian country. The whole country decided to give up uh, not just coins. We're debating the penny. They give up currency. They go, everybody used their debit card. And yeah. all the businesses and banks said, we no longer take paper and coins. We're just completely digital. So he printed $8 trillion. He they didn't go out and tax eight trillion. They didn't collect eight trillion dollars in tax revenue. They printed. They created eight trillion out of thin air. So when people say that America, um, you know, we're protecting all these other countries for free and they don't pay their bills or things like that, dude, that military is part of that brand of that um, that you're the reserve currency. And nobody's going to switch to the reserve currency for communist China because there's yeah. no checks and balances. There's no legal system. But as long as you're the reserve currency and as long as now 90 percent of all banking is ones and zeros and digital, you have no idea how many billions of dollars are creating, transferring, moving. I mean, it's all it's all smoke and mirrors. It's fiat currency. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, got from gold right. and silver to paper to now just electricity. And is to it, have that be uh, an American asset is priceless. And it's because of our brand, especially after World War II. I also want to say one thing about marketing, um, but things about marketing is, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing to brand a Reese's peanut butter cup or a box of Kraft dinner <laughs> or a car or a Ferrari, but healthcare is very different because when you come to me and I say, you know, you have prostate cancer and you have to have a surgery. Well, what, what are you supposed to do with that? I mean, you're just looking at me like, is this the guy? Is this the best guy? Do I have to do it? Imagine a woman. The doctor says, yeah, you need a, a double mastectomy. Well, I mean, that, that, that's serious, serious stuff. And yeah. she has to trust you. So we sell the invisible. So when you go out there, these women are getting two or three different opinions and they're trying to get trust. So they go about it, which they think is best. Like, well, I'm going to go to the doctor that goes to my same church or, you know, or my mom, her friend, she had her mastectomy from Ralph. So I'm going to go there, but that's that, how do you make, so it's all on trust and in healthcare, very few people realize you sell invisible. When you come into me from marketing and I tell you, you have four cavities and they're two fifty a piece. That's a thousand bucks. And you're like, mm -hmm. well, I just, I just wanted my teeth clean. I, I don't know if I have cavities. Why, why do I know I need cavities? And then you look at the data. Two out of three people diagnosed with a cavity don't get a drilled fill and bill. They leave. You only drill yeah. fill and bill 30%. So in healthcare, Mayo Clinic builds trust. Cleveland Clinic, Scripps out by you in San Diego. John Hopkins, Sloan, Keter, um, you know, the, the Houston uh, Clinic, um, and I think that we sell the invisible and it all comes down to trust. And a couple of trust things I've noticed big over the last 30 years is that, you know, you go into schools and you mm -hmm. give them all a fun kit. And it might have your toothbrush, your name and number, some sugarless gum, whatever. But then you'd hear parents say, well, yeah, I saw that, um, you know, Desert Vista, you know, there's a lot of dentists in Ahwatukee, but, you know, they're, they're, they have you come into our school. 
So even though I was just out hustling, they bought into it. It was a third person endorsement. Um, yeah. When the biggest underutilized activity in America is mergers and acquisitions, they do it in Fortune 500 all day long. So old man McGregor, three miles down the street, he's selling his practice. And right now you're spending a hundred dollars per new patient, let's say on Google ads or Facebook ads or whatever. And then you go out there and his practice for sale and you divide it by the number of charts that have been in one time last 24 months. It's about 80 bucks a chart. But when you buy old man McGregor's practice, you know what everybody thinks? They go, you know, when he retired, you know who he chose to take care of his flock? It was the good old Dr. Good. Yeah. So the patients see it. They didn't see it as he was the highest bidder. They don't even know that it works like that. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. they sit there and they say, well, I thought it was pretty neat that <laughs> after old Henry retired after 45 years that he sent all of our records to you. So it's an implied endorsement. Whenever you can get a third person endorsement, that's why people like to get any plaque they can, the top dentist or some award or something. It's really nice to have. If I walk up to you at a party and I say, hey, I'm Howard Fran, I'm all that. You think, well, that's a narcissistic weirdo. Like, but if okay. Ryan walks up to you and says, see that guy over there? That's my dad. He is all that and two bags of chips. Then you'd like, well, really? Really? Why? Why? Why is that? You always want a third person endorsement, especially when you're selling the invisible. And when I go to get my oil change and I did, and cause the check light came on, I know every single time some kid's going to walk out there and say, well, you know, you really should drain your transmission fluid yeah. and you should get an air filter. And I'm just sitting there looking at this kid. Like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what it's based on. I mean, I grew up with five sisters playing Barbie dolls. I've never seen transmission fluid. I don't know where an air filter is. I've never seen a spark plug, uh, but I could dress up Ken doll 30 different ways <laughs> and had my own Barbie house. That a good and, and sometimes I was so good. I take a Q-tip with Vaseline and grease Barbie's long boots so that when you slipped them on, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't split. So okay. it's really, and that's why I always take my car to where I bought it because I just kind of think since I bought my car there, maybe yeah. you're more honest than somebody I don't know. So I don't know. I, I, I always take my car and all my friends say, why do you take it to the Lexus dealership? That's you could get it on half the price anywhere. And it's like, well, ha what, what is half the price if you don't even know if you need it? Uh, you know, what is, what is half the price if it's not even done right? But I, I think doctors need to realize that the main the main goal of marketing is trust. And I'll tell you what, Google, I, I'm, I'm afraid of Google stock because Google, they've got all these different investments. Yeah, they but do. when you look at their 10K every year, they still make 90% of all their money off search ads on search. Mm -hmm. And if I go Google Phoenix dentist, I'm going to get 8 million hit. I'm going to get 8 million pages of shit, which is all noise. Because you never even go maybe to the second page, let alone the third. You're mm -hmm. not going to click through, you know, Ryan, yeah. Ryan, Google Phoenix dentist and just see how many come up. But if I was on Facebook, see, I think Facebook could walk away with it because I'd rather go on Facebook. And you know, let's say I needed a uh, uh, something that's invisible that I don't know or something that, that's service driven. Uh, say, say, say I needed a, okay. a dermatologist. And I search um, dermatologists on my friends and they say, well, you have three friends that like this dermatologist page and you have two friends that like this dermatologist page. Then I can see my three friends. And I say, wow, Tim and Todd both go to this dermatologist. Then I can immediately just text Tim and say, hey, do you go to Dr. Ferreira? And yeah. I say, yeah, why? And I said, well, I just did a search on Facebook. I need a dermatologist. I got a spot. I think I have sun cancer. Is he any good? And he's like, yeah, I've been going there for 10 years, dude. And he does three other dentists. You know what I mean? That's the third person endorsement right there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, how many did it come up with? 650,000 dentists come up when I search Jeez. dentists on Google. So it's just noise. It's so much mega data noise. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. I want, you know, I don't need to ask my friend, um, um, where to buy an iPhone or a Coke or a cheeseburger. Mm -hmm, but if it's invisible, if it's, if someone said to me, you got to have prostate surgery, I'd like, whoa, say what? Um, you had cancer. 
Um, I just went to a dentist and he said I had, I had 11 cavities. How the shit could I have 11 cavities? I want to get a second opinion, not by someone who's uh, come up on a Google page. I want to get a second opinion by somebody that I can trust. And if I don't know Michael Arias from a hole in the wall, but my best buddy George Bob says you're the bomb, then I'm walking in there with trust and I'm no longer thinking... Is he a shyster? Is, is he lying? Yeah. Is he just trying to sell me a new transmission? You know, like, uh-huh. like the, the air conditioning repairman. I swear in Phoenix, every time your air conditioner breaks down, <laughs> whoever the shit shows up will tell you you need a brand new air conditioner. So really? then you just sit there and you wait because I got this one guy who doesn't work for a chain. He's just some guy who has one truck, lives out of his home, and he's mm-hmm. always booked three weeks in advance when it's 118 degrees out. And I'll sit there and say, you know okay. what? I'll, I'll suffer for four or five days because I know if I call anybody on television, I know, I know, I need a brand new air conditioner. Then he shows up with some duct duct tape and WD-40 and gives it a shot of Freon and says, I'm sorry, but I had to give you a, a shot of Freon. And that stuff is like, I mean, it's really expensive. I mean, a gallon yeah. of Freon. Give Google how much a gallon of Freon costs. I, it, this is crazy stuff. We should get out of dentistry. And get into free, <laughs> free on. Get into free on. It's fifty dollars a pound. Now remember, water is eight pounds a gallon. It's okay. fifty. It's what? Wow. It's four hundred dollars a gallon. Jeez, for free on. Four hundred dollars. And and this guy will come and say, "Man, I'm so sorry. I had to give you. It took a lot of free on, and it's four hundred dollars a gallon." But see, I don't care because I trust this guy. And if this guy said. That's the last time I'm going to do it. You need a new air conditioner. Then I'd say, well, just order one now. But I don't have a problem with buying a new air conditioner. I don't have a problem with changing the air filter in my car. I just don't want to have it done when it's not necessary. And I don't trust you. And I think you're lying. And you're just trying to make money off me yeah. uh, by doing by cutting on my teeth or removing my mastectomy or my, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so, so, so the, then the, the unique problem with dentistry, we sell the invisible. It's all based on trust. So then like, what do you think about Yelp or like third party websites like that? Um, I am. Um, okay. You got to remember I'm, I'm a grandpa. I got four boys, two <laughs> grandchildren. I've never in my circle of friends, I've never seen anybody use Yelp one time in my entire life. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Now you're my children's age. You're Greg's 26, uh, Ryan here is 24. You guys, I hear you guys talking about all the time, but so then I go to Dentaltown. And Dentaltown, I want everybody to use the search function because that damn thing cost me $50,000. And whenever I upgrade it, <laughs> it's the Google search box. So when you come to Dentaltown, all the servers are black in Iraq, and then there's yeah. this yellow box that says Google. And the only way to update is you gotta buy a new box, and it's that damn box is 50 grand. So every time I upgrade Jeez. my search i could have bought a damn car but if i go in there and type in yelp there is nothing but bad noise i mean it's just it's just i mean i mean now if i go in there and say facebook ad i don't hear a bunch of screaming and fussing and crazy if i say google ad word i mean it's all good if i say postcards it's all good but you say yelp I've never read anything good about Yelp on Dentaltown, and these guys are all doctors with 8 to 12 years of college. So it yeah. seems like they're only good at really one thing, and that is pissing off all my homies yeah, on Dentaltown. Like this, what, why, 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 do, do you agree with that or disagree with that? I, I agree. Oh, well, here's the thing. like I agree to a sense because like Yelp first started off as like that trust, right? Like, hey, look, your friends are reviewing people on here. Look what people are saying about this dentist. And to be honest with you, so many – people or business owners are obsessed with the reviews, right? Like they'll, they'll entice it. They'll, they'll, they're just obsessed with it. And the hard thing is like, you can go to school for five, 12, 20 years, right? But if you have a page on there that has nothing but bad reviews and then your Google shows bad reviews on Google, and then let's just say Facebook shows bad reviews, like you're not going to get, you know what I mean? Like all the all the right people that you want or anything, no matter how many years you went to school because of like maybe one employee. But I do agree that Yelp though, it's kind of made all of us become experts at stuff we really don't know. So for example, like we can say, oh, the dentist tried to upcharge me. You know, he tried to say I had seven cavities, although like the guy really never flosses or he only brushes his teeth 
maybe once a day or whatever. And he's like, but then I went to another dentist and he told me I only had three. This guy's, tr- he's just a shyster. He's trying to like, you know, get, take me for my money. But in reality, you really do have those cavities, but now you look like a bad guy, right? Now you look bad. And here's the thing, like Yelp is being sued constantly. Every single day, they're always being sued and they have to go to court because of the reviews that are trying to be taken down. So I do believe that Yelp, in a sense, like to me at least, I do believe like if you start paying for their like maybe ads or something, they'll start, because I don't know if you noticed, but they'll um, even hide the good recommendations, right? They'll hide those and they'll sometimes just leave the bad ones. And it's like, man, well, this person is a real person. It even shows that they had 21 friends. They left other reviews on other people's sites. But for some reason, Yelp hides it. According, because I've asked them, I've asked them why. They just tell me it's according to their algorithm, right? So I do believe, like, if you leave a review on Google or um, Facebook, it's a lot better than Yelp. Because Yelp, it's not, it's a third-party website. You can't control it. You know well, what I mean? Well, you know, you know what would mean a lot to me is the um, the video reviews. Because, like, okay, oh, not yeah. throwing my family under a bridge, but uh, say Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, I got aunts and uncles and cousins that if you could actually see them when they were talking – you would just, by seeing them, you would know they were batshit crazy, okay? <laughs> I am absolutely the only normal one in the entire <laughs> friend family. So if I was reading a review that says all this, but it was my crazy aunt with crazy eyes, you know, talking weird, crazy, then I, I, I could dismiss that. But seeing something in text takes so much out of it. But if I saw a really compelling human, like, if I saw you with your shit together, sitting in the dental chair, or standing next to me saying, I just want you to know, you know, I had a really, you know, I had this issue, and I came here, and thanks, kudos to Dr. Fran for working me in and fixing it up, and it didn't hurt, and it all turned out great, and thank yeah. you so much. And I could see that it was coming from you, uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the Unabomber living in some... Uh, you know, shack out in the middle of nowhere with a beard three feet long and has that, you know what I mean? I mean, it just, yeah, it just, yeah. <laughs> I just, I just would want my, my, I just think it's more compelling. I think, uh, I think that it should do regarding Facebook ads. They should do all the free stuff. They should do Facebook live reviews with their patients leaving. I mean, whenever you see a patient verklempt, man, have your dental assistant pull out her iPhone and snap the, the, the Facebook account for your office and, do a live interview. I mean, I scrolling down, seeing memes from dental offices, to me, it'd be very different <laughs> if I saw a patient. This is Shirley. She came in here and, uh, you know, and uh, what, do you, what do you think, Shirley? Oh, my God, I love it, blah, blah. And then one last thing to millennials, because I can't believe we're having so much fun. We went way over time. We're at oh, hour 12. Um, Jeez, one last thing is that, um, you know, one uh, mistake I see millennials do a lot? Yeah. They think, well, who's going to get cosmetic dentistry? Oh, the rocking hot young pretty girl on her way to palm crane or she wants to grow uh, and be yeah. a model. That chick doesn't have a nickel. You yeah. know who buys all the cosmetic dentistry? Little old ladies. 65, 75, 85. When you tell a 75-year-old lady and her tooth breaks off and this and I say, you know what? Everything in your mouth, it's all it's all done back in the day. This is breaking this. And I'll tell you what, if we did the upper 10 teeth. I swear to God, it'd take 10 years off your face. You would look, you wouldn't look a day over 65. You're like, oh my God. Oh my God. You know, you want to say, it'd be so pretty. They wouldn't even notice that liver spot on your head and the fact that you're bald. I mean, uh, you know, but those people paid off their house. Their kids are gone. They paid off their, only 10% of Americans buy anything over a thousand dollars in cash, especially when it comes to house and cars. And they all got one thing in common. They're all over 65. Yeah, and, right. and that's the ones with the, that you decide to give the discount to. Shouldn't the discount go to the young newlyweds who uh, have three kids and, and holding down three jobs? No, you give it to the senior citizen discount who paid off the house, paid off the car, bought her last three cars in cash. But I swear to God, the people that are making the most bank in full mouth rehabs, whether it be replacing a denture to all on four, or the upper 10 veneers, they're all targeting uh, the cosmetics to the little old lady who wants to go back to her 50-year high school reunion and make everyone jealous. That's the ones hiring a nutritionist. I mean, these, these mm-hmm. women plan two years in advance to go back to some of these reunions.
Yeah, nice. I'm going to go back to Iowa and I'm going to be the sexiest woman <laughs> from the class of 1912. <laughs> and she'll give you all the money to do it. But, I know. Uh, hey, no, you're uh, right. big fan of your podcast on Dentaltown. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you'd update. I mean, you have how, how many shows do you have? Right now, I think I'm at 67. But I know on Dental Town, I need to catch up on uploading. Yeah, um, because I called you. You didn't call me. Um, uh, you uh, you have so many fans on Dental Town. So many of my friends that I actually uh, drink with. But when, by the way, that drinking thing, if you ever find out a, uh, a sugar-free diet uh, beer, uh, I'm, I'm Irish. So <laughs> You're not going to like it, man. You need to send me the, the – and for my, my buddies, Water. they're going to need a, uh, a sugar-free diet vodka. Yeah, man. Any uh, any nutrition questions or anything like that? Health and wellness. Always ask me if you want. I'm always okay. Crazy. We'll Facetime you live from the bar. Ask me <laughs> what's uh But no, they, that's what I love about dentists. They're always smart. Like you know, they they know what they're doing wrong. Like and when we go to the bar, you'll hear dentists say, <laughs> "Well, if I was smart. I'd just eat the chili. You know, I would just eat the chili and get a glass of iced tea. But I'm going to have a shot of Fireball, a beer, and get the nacho chips. <laughs> and, to, and seriously, Ryan, don't say Tim or Todd's name while we're talking about him. <laughs> and uh but anyway um hey thanks for all you do for dental town thanks so much for unloading uh uploading your podcast um i think it's uh um awesome what you do and i'm sorry i'm too old to have ever seen a unicorn the loch ness monster or a yelp user <laughs> or a yelp user nah it's okay we won't, probably won't see yelp users for a while anyways who knows all right buddy have a rocking hot day all right man you too you be safe bye